have to see if there are any who understand the times and will seek his face continually so that he will intervene in the affairs of nations, churches, families, and individuals in response to their supplication just like he did in the days of old. God conditions the very life and prosperity of his church upon men and women who will catch his passion and share his burden. He has a burden for a lost world. If you never connect with that, you're disconnected. God is looking down from heaven upon every generation for weepers and warriors, intermediaries, intercessors, battle veterans. That's the bottom line to this whole redemption business. That's the purpose of the church. That's the reason for because of the times. God told Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, that he would spare the city for just one. He told Abraham, I'll spare the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah for just a handful of weepers and warriors. We cannot treat casually that what is all important to God. God told Isaiah, I have set watchmen upon the walls of Zion, the church, weepers and warriors which shall not hold their peace who will give me no rest day nor night until, until, until the divine edict is they that sow in tears shall reap, shall reap in and he that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall what? Come again rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Preachers, this is more than scholarly exposition. This is more than delivering sermons of exegetical exactitude perfection. This is more than charisma or natural endowments or wit or wisdom or genius or accoutrements. God is calling for weepers and warriors who will strike a balance, who will strike a balance between weeping and warring, praying and serving, saying and doing, between intercession and action. This great apostolic Jesus name message is only intellectual and academic until it assumes blood, life, gut-wrenching burden and tears and is witness in the power of the Holy Ghost to every creature on planet earth. We say we love it, but seldom share it. The awesome revelation of the mighty God in Christ for the purpose of redemption of the human race is more than a doctrine. It is a divine revelation of a mystery hid from the foundation of the world now made manifest to be declared to the whole world. That's what the incarnation is all about. And you have never locked eyes with another human being that God does not love. And get this, he crossed that stormy sea to get to a demon-possessed maniac and delivered him, he delivered a maniac, he crossed a stormy sea to do it. Told him then to go back to his family and friends and tell them what great things he had done for them. Got back in that same boat and went back to the other side and kept healing and blessing and delivering. That passion must overwhelm us. And until it does, there's no need to go any further. That's the passion you've got to get a hold of before you leave here. It's got to consume us so that we cannot help but preach it, teach it, publish it to the whole world with signs following. Never in the history of the church has this church had such towering potential to impact humanity. The possibilities are endless. 
There are no boundaries to our opportunities. The gates of hell are powerless to stop the advancement of the kingdom of God. The gates of hell cannot prevail against me, my family, my church, or any other factor of my life that comes under the authority of God's promise to His church. There may be temporary circumstances that indicate otherwise, but when the final paragraph of the conflict is written, it will reveal that Jesus Christ prevailed once again. And if you will have it, when you leave this place, you will go forth as a conqueror. You will go forth in the power of the Holy Ghost, in the authority of the mighty, only saving name of Jesus Christ, and from this day forward, every time you preach, expect souls to be saved. Expect people to be divinely healed and delivered. Expect God to confirm your ministry, your ministry, your ministry with signs following. On January the 27th, 1903, fire broke out in a London lunatic asylum. Of the 300 inmates, 50 perished, and 250 had to be literally pulled out of the fire. Every sane man and woman went quickly to help, to help pull people out of the fire that were literally burning up. The time was short, their doom was certain, the work was great and urgent, so every other interest was set aside. Uh -huh. One thing was needful, and that was to rescue as many as possible yeah. before they literally burned up. It wasn't easy. Some laughed at the mention of fire. Some said, do you think I'm going to leave my bed in the middle of the night and go out? They hid under the beds. Others thought it was a joke. Some fought the rescuers, biting them, tearing their clothes. Some were heard knocking at the closed door to get out. But it was too late. But 250 were literally pulled out of the fire. So it isn't easy to pull them out of the fire. No one said it was. Not Jesus, not the apostles, not the martyred saints. But they did say that all sane, blood-bought, blood Holy Ghost-filled, Jesus' name, apostolic believers should make it their business to get as many souls pulled out of the fire, whatever the cost. How shall they, the lost, hear without a preacher? How shall they believe if someone never tells them? How shall they hear without, say, a preacher? Say, a preacher. A preacher. Not a pulpiteer, a preacher. And how shall the preacher preach except he be sent? We need preachers who have been called from another world and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they've been called, that they've got a message that belongs to the whole world that will preach everywhere they go, not just in a pulpit, pulling people out of the fire. Preachers, if that's not your consuming passion, plainly put, you need to do something else. You need to save yourself a world of frustration and do one of the other things. Be a lawyer. Go to a medical school. Drive a truck. Program computers. None of them require a divine call. But if you're a God-called preacher, then you ought to prepare better than a trial lawyer facing the biggest case. You ought to study harder than a doctor preparing for brain surgery. You ought to stay more alert than a trucker hauling a nuclear bomb. Because if the lawyer loses his case, his client goes to jail. Uh, yeah. Yours goes to outer darkness. Oh. If the surgeon's hand slips, his patient spends 30 years in a wheelchair. Yours spends forever in hell. Oh. Oh. 
If the trucker breaks concentration, his mistake blasts a hole the size of Yankee Stadium. Yours drives off into a bottomless pit. They'll never get out of there, folks. They're there now begging for one drop of water. I don't care whether you believe it or not. There is a hell and a literal burning lake of fire where people will go that hasn't obeyed the gospel and they're begging for one drop of water. Preachers, we have the toughest job in town. That's pulling people out of the fire. Teaching and training them to pull others out of the fire. If you are a God-called preacher and inwardly believe in your divine calling, all the devils in hell can't stop you. Demons in this earth cannot stop your effective ministry. You will win souls and you will build churches and you will snatch souls out of the burning. So you're a preacher, is that right? Is that what you call yourself, a preacher? Is that what you are? So you're a preacher. You need to be more interested about altars being jammed with souls and seeking God than the status quo. You need, to be, you need to be more concerned about souls and Robert's rule of orders. You need to know the Bible so well. You need to know it better than an attorney knows the law and a doctor knows his medicine. You definitely need to know it better than the devil knows it and he knows it and can quote it. The Bible is not an edited book. God literally tells it like it is. And the book says there is absolutely no place in the kingdom of God for spectators and Sunday morning Christians. And God has requirements for everybody sitting in this room. He made a powerful investment in every one of you. And He wants a return on His investment. And if you do not give it to him, you may well hear him say, Depart from me. Give me what you took from me. I'll give it to somebody that will do something with it. Not much sacrifice demanded from us today. Not, not much cross-bearing. Not much witnessing. We want to be as comfortable as possible. Flitting from ecstasy to ecstasy. Following the current evangelist heartthrob from New York to Los Angeles. My cum lauded friend, don't waste the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't waste this mighty, powerful baptism of the Holy Ghost. Don't waste the name that's above every name in heaven and in earth. Don't waste the mighty, powerful sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. I've been sent with these mighty weapons to snatch souls out of the fire, whatever the cost. And if I'm not going to use them, I'm going to give them back. John Wesley, the noted reformer, spent 15 to 18 hours a day praying, studying, and preaching. Right. Traveled a quarter of a million miles, not in a 747, but mostly on horseback. Uh -huh. Conducted 40,000 public services at 85 years of age. Uh -huh. Preached no less than five times every day, said, I plant one foot in hell and the other in eternity, and I snatch as many brands from the burning as I possibly can. Yes, sir. Charles Haddon Spurgeon pastored Metropolitan Tabernacle in London a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago. Brian and Renee Bozier flew me there to see it because they knew how I admired his work. Spurgeon said, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, begging them not to go there. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. And let not one go there unwarned or unprayed for. Don't abandon a soul to hell that you can keep from going there. I read your book, Jerry, Terry. I read your book. It's powerful on the book of Acts. That's how Spurgeon felt about it. But you know what? Spurgeon isn't there anymore, snatching souls out of hell, and now it's nothing but a little shell there, and they talk about how it used to be. Because there ain't nobody there snatching souls out of hell. 
Why are those today that will cry out, if you're going to hell, you'll go there over my dead body. If you're going to hell, it will be with my arms around your knees begging you to be saved. I'm tired of reading about men and women like that. I'm tired of reading about prayer revivals and an Evan Roberts and the prayer revival in Korea. I'm not going to just run the aisles here and jump and shout, turn things upside down here. I'm going to get out there and turn my world upside down. We don't need you turning things upside down in here. We need you to turn things upside down out there. I remember hearing preachers when they were so desperate to reach souls after they preached, they'd put the Bible at the front door and beg people not to walk out over that uh, Bible and plunge headlong into hell. Where does that burden go? There was an urgency. There was a burden. There was a fervent, compelling force. There was somebody knowing the terror of the Lord pulling souls out of hell. Where's your fervency? Where's your burden? Where's your fire? Where's your concern? Preacher, so you're a preacher, is that right? I was in Super Warm Christmas. Saw a beautiful woman, I told her so. She said, what's your name? I said, Vesta Mangan. She said, would you pray for me? I said, I'd be glad to. She said, I'm not ashamed. I said, well, honey, I'm sure not ashamed. I grabbed that little old hurting, beautiful woman's hand and I began to pray there. Honey, I had a healing line right there in Super One before I got through with her. 